Okay, good morning again. Uh, the House Study Committee on Annexation, Deannexation, and Incorporation, or House Resolution 743, is now called to order. I'm just wondering if somebody's trying to play a joke on me to test my patience. Or <laughs> but anyway, we all survived, and I appreciate your patience and bearing with us as uh, we've ma now made our way into a room where the microphone works and uh, everything seems to be fine. Uh, I am a state representative and I represent House District 160 and that includes uh, the majority of Bullock County and a few thousand folks out of North Bryan County. I am the uh, chairman of the Intergovernmental Coordination Committee and chair of the study committee. I've already welcomed all of you. I appreciate again, once again, your patience and uh, bearing with us. I do appreciate the fact, too, that many of you have taken time out of very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, some of you who are not on the committee have asked to make comments, and we have reserved at least the last 20 minutes of this meeting for public comments, with each speaker being allowed two minutes. You also always have the option, <clears throat> excuse me, to submit um, more detailed comments in a written statement that we can can and will make available to all our committee members. I am respectfully letting all of you know before we even get started that we do have a zero tolerance uh, policy uh, t as to personal attacks, threats, or any other disruptive behavior. If you do have that sort of behavior, we will ask you to please leave our meeting. But you all look like nice folks and I don't think this is gonna be an issue at all. If you are here with a group, as I said earlier, you may decide to choose one person to be your spokesperson. And if you still haven't signed up, we do have a sign up list and you could quietly make your way up here and sign up. Uh, I do wanna talk a little bit about the fact that it's important that we all know that this study committee's overall mission is to undertake a real careful look at the conditions, needs, issues, and problems that may exist relevant to annexation, deannexation, and incorporation. And if it becomes necessary, uh, this committee may recommend any action or legislation that they deem necessary or appropriate at the time the committee is abolished. Um, please do keep in mind that this is not a public hearing. It's not a town hall meeting but it is an opportunity for an appointed study committee to closely examine the current uh, legislative process and how that process impacts the citizens that we all serve all over the great state of Georgia, not just the metro area of Atlanta. The House Study Committee, as you can see, is composed of five members of the House of Representatives and they were all appointed by the Speaker. Today is our first meeting. We have two additional meetings scheduled. One is on September the 4th, I mean, I'm sorry, September the 24th, that will be our second committee meeting. And the last meeting on October the 6th. Uh, the committee will be abolished on December the 1st, 2015. Today, this committee's focus is strictly on annexation and deannexation. The September the 24th meeting will be to address issues <clears throat> involving the incorporation of cities. The agenda will include all the speakers we have today, as well as Ted Baggett from the Carl Vincent Institute of Government to speak on the relevance of fiscal studies. The final meeting will be an opportunity to call for additional information from, previous speak from a previous speaker or speakers and for other comments or questions from the committee. Public comments will be allowed at each meeting. Before we move on to the introduction of our committee members, I would like to introduce Leo Chauncey. He is seated to my left, and he is the policy analyst for my Intergovernmental Coordination Committee, and he's been assigned to work with this study committee. We are, ve we are very fortunate to have him and the experience that he brings to us uh, on these particular issues. At this time, I'm gonna call on our committee members uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask them to take no more than two minutes to, to introduce themselves and to make a few comments. And we will begin to my right with Representative Beth Beskins. Thank you. Is this working, is it on? One minute. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Hangersley. I'm Beth Beskin. I represent House District 54, 
which is all within the city of Atlanta. I represent Buckhead and parts of historic Brookhaven. I'm now halfway through my first session in the House, and shortly after I got here last January, um, I, I realized that the city of Atlanta was working to do some broad-scale resolution referendum annexations, both in DeKalb County, Druid Hills, as well as in South Fulton. And I realized how directly that affected all of my constituents in the city of Atlanta, and so I paid a lot of attention to those bills as they passed through last session, and I'm, I'm delighted and honored to serve on this committee because I think the work we're going to do is very important to all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Beskins. Now we'll call on Representative Tom Taylor. Yeah, Tom. Oops. Tom Taylor, I represent uh, Dunwoody, um, North DeKalb, um, part of Doraville over to the GM uh, plant site and a little bit of Chambly. Um, actually, it's like old home week here for me. I think I spent like three years in this committee with Susan, Marsha, Don Bolia, um, Bill Floyd. Um, and you're back there somewhere in the corner. Um, it, it's uh, one of the first uh, meetings I've been to with uh, annexation or incorporation with the cabinet. We didn't have state troopers out in the hall, which is a good sign. Um, that's chance that's going to keep it calm. Um, sort of the subject matter expert on this. I've been through it from the conceptual stage uh, through uh, forming a 501c3 running that, doing the legislative side, and actually starting a city, and then representing it in the, in the House. So um, wide open to the, the comments here, but um, interesting, and I'm sure we get a lot of input uh, from the folks here. Thank you, Representative Taylor. Uh, Chairman Ed Reinders is to my left. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. For the most part, you're a fairly good-looking group. <laughs> I'm uh, Ed Rinders from Lee County down in southwest Georgia, and I chair the governmental affairs, which most of you in the room realizes that's where the incorporations of the cities go through that particular committee. Uh, my focus will primarily be to remind everybody that what we do, if we do anything, and I'm not absolutely convinced the current system is broken, but if we do anything, um, that we understand that it infects the entire state. I, it's not my belief that what works here has to work there, that it, we just have to be uniform in what, in what we do. I understand that a lot of people have and should constituent concerns because that's where they represent and they're going to do what they have to do. But that, you know, I'm not going to pick whether St. Mary's needs recreation and this city needs water. That, that's for the people to decide. I'm a big fan of self-determination. I understand sometimes when people object they look at various methods procedurally to try to what I call game the system. Um, but again, I, I'm motivated by letting the people ultimately decide. But I do believe they need to have that kind of information uh, that they can make an informed decision on and um, that they really understand if a library means a library and not just two books somewhere, and that's one of the three services. I just need to make sure we have those kind of definitions uh, clear in the, in, the, in the process. And then finally, I, I, I think it's just absolutely important that we do recognize that at the end of the day one size doesn't fit all but I don't want anybody to ever be accused of well you did this for one particular city or one particular county and you didn't do it for someone else I, I, I think intellectually we have a hard time picking winners and losers and, and I just don't want to do that so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity thank you chairman Rinders and now I'll call on representative Mary Margaret Oliver thank you ma'am I serve House District 82, which is in the middle of DeKalb County, which goes from the city of Decatur to the southern part of the city of Brookhaven. And in my political career, I've represented Avondale, Decatur, Chambly, Dorville, city of Atlanta. Um, and every square inch of my House District is subject to competing maps today for either annexations or incorporations. Uh, my constituents are very much ground zero of unhappiness with process from their perspective from their perspective there's there's some process issues that would help them that could be improved that would help them uh, understand their right to be determine right to determine how they wish to be governed how you wish to be governed is a political process and we live in a political world is our political process as fair and open and transparent as it can be uh, I want to recognize Bill Floyd, former Mayor Bill Floyd, uh, who with the City of Decatur will be hosting this weekend in the City of Decatur the largest independent book festival in the United States of America. There will be 80,000 people coming 
to see 100 authors, and you're all invited. Thank you, Representative Oliver, and thank you all committee members for your comments. At this time, um, I would be pleased to introduce our first presenter, and that is Jeff Lanier. He's been with the Georgia General Assembly since 2000, working in the Office of Legislative Counsel. Jeff works with ethics, governmental affairs, rules and special rules, standing committees in the House, and their counterparts in the Senate. Jeff will be making a brief presentation on the annexation process as it relates to the official code of Georgia annotated. Jeff Lanier. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I don't want to get too far into the details. Uh, you know, if we want to go there on annexation, we'll certainly proceed down. But once we get way down the weeds, I don't think it benefits anybody. So what I want to give you, if I can, during the period of time that's allotted to me, is a kind of a high-level overview of the annexation process in Georgia today. And I'll be open to any questions you would have afterwards. Uh, annexation in Georgia right now takes one of four forms. There are four different methods that we have to annex property. The first is legislative annexation, by which a local bill is passed through the General Assembly that designates a piece of property and brings it into a municipality. That is uh, very uh, a wide open <laughs> game. It's very unlimited in its um, scope and as well as what it can you can do as a member of the General Assembly or the General Assembly can do as uh, as it regards a piece of property. Uh, you have plenary authority on annexations. Municipalities are basically are creatures of the General Assembly and consequently you can modify them as you choose to do so. The one caveat we have is that if you're annexing in a piece of property uh, which has a, a <coughs> population that is 3% or 500 people, 3% of the population of the city you're annexing it into, or 500 people, you must have a referendum on the annexation. Other than that, you're free to do as you choose. For instance, one thing that's been done in the past by the General Assembly, again, I don't comment on the wisdom of any of these things, but the fact that it has been done, I must point out to you, that a city can't do, for instance, is to annex non-contiguous property. The General Assembly, if it chooses to do so, can place a non-contiguous piece of property into a municipality, for instance. Um, the, the cities, uh, like I say, just are creatures of the General Assembly, so you have widespread uh, powers when it comes to that regard. The other three methods are initiated uh, by the citizens and in cooperation with a municipality. The first one is the 100% uh, the method by which a person who owns a piece of property uh, that is contiguous to a city may ask the city to be uh, annexed into the property and if the city agrees then that becomes a part of that city. Um, there are some, uh, as I say with each of the methods, some uh, details that, and criteria by which you got to meet but these are general overviews. So if somebody wants to be in the city and the city agrees the 100% method works. Um, the next method is the 60-60 method, which you have a petition from 60% of the property owners of a particular parcel or area, and 60% of the voters petition the city to be incorporated or brought into the incorporated city through annexation, and if the city agrees, the property comes in. The final method is the resolution referendum method by which the city passes a resolution that says we would like to annex this particular area adjacent to our city and then a referendum is held among the residents of that area and if it passes then that area becomes a part of the city. So we have legislative 100%, 60-60 and resolution referendum methods by which annexation can be conducted. Now what I don't really consider annexation method, although it is annexation, I think it's a, a separate hybrid thing is the annexation of unincorporated islands into a city and that is just done in the city's discretion. An unincorporated island uh, real quickly is just an area that's unincorporated that's basically been closed in by the boundaries of cities or has become inaccessible uh, to the county to provide adequate services for that area as a result of annexations, incorporation of new cities, well, a variety of factors that could come into play. And the city can determine if they want to annex the incorporated island, but that's unincorporated island, but that's in their judgment if they choose to do it or not. The de-annexation process takes two forms again. There is legislative de-annexation, which is equally 
as broad as the uh, annexation process as the minimum as the general assembly you can de-annex any piece of property you want to from a city um, by passing a, a local act and and uh, it just goes there's no referendum required although you could conduct one if you chose um, but it's just simply a, a passing a local act and, and removing a particular area from a city the other one is done by an agreement application and agreement if a property owner or owners do not uh, want to remain within a city they can apply to the city and ask to be de-annexed and if the city and the county agree to the de-annexation then it, it takes place it's kind of the hundred percent method in reverse if you will uh, it's interesting here because the county is brought in with a say so on whether or not that uh, process goes forward which is not necessarily true in the others there is a method by which counties can object to annexations. If y'all are interested in that, we can certainly plow that ground, but uh, it's, uh, it, it is a very, I guess, convoluted process to a degree. Uh, and it's uh, not always effective from all the county's interest in uh, stopping an annexation. It deals mainly with the effect of zoning, uh, in my opinion, more so than actually stopping a process. It may uh, delay a zoning change in a particular area. One of the things that kind of comes up with annexations, since they are local legislation with the General Assembly, that I've noticed that we have uh, any local bill that is introduced in the General Assembly under 28114 requires it to be advertised um, before the bill can be introduced. Um, <laughs> the, then there's an affidavit that has to be associated with it. And as a part of the requirements of the law, the, if you're amending a, an act uh, creating a city, in this case, if you're annexing territory into it, you have to amend the act to redescribe the city boundaries. You're also required to give notice of that uh, fact to the city directly. A lot of times that's not difficult because the city is the one asking for the annexation. So there's no surprise there. And it would probably surprise me if you were annexing territory into a city and you hadn't told them you're going to do it. That would probably cause a lot of trepidation for the city. Um, but there's that, that notice that has to be, be given. And if, uh, and I'm sure all of you have handled local legislation, there's an affidavit requirement that you swear that indeed you have given the required notices to the, um, the gen, uh, to the cities affected or the counties affected. In fact, we, until recently, on the ads that we would prepare, we prepare an ad, local ad. We doesn't, you don't have to use our ad, of course, but we prepare one with every local bill. We would attach one of these yellow stickies to it that, advises you you've got to publish the notice and if it affects the city charter or county commission uh, a copy of the notice must be provided to them we are changing that starting this year and you're going to get a, a little bit more expansive notice attached to your ads to uh, give you a little further information on that but those things are provided so that cities uh, will and counties will know that um, uh, something about is about to happen to them now, the law in that particular regard is being fairly open when it comes to what the notice says. Um, it kind of sometimes defeats the purpose of the notice, in my opinion, but that is the law. For instance, you could annex property into a city simply by saying, uh, notice is hereby given that a, a bill will be introduced at the next session of the General Assembly to amend the charter of the city of so-and-so and for other purposes. That doesn't really give you a lot of notice on what's about to happen to you I guess it gives you a little notice that it's going to happen and the fact that these things are advertised in the legal ads also makes them a little bit uh, more obscure now it's the legal ads uh, there's a game you must necessarily play uh, in order to give notice to people uh, we everybody's presumed to have read all the legals you know when we advertise you know, for instance uh, you can if you can't locate somebody and you want to file a lawsuit against them, you can serve them with permission of the court by advertising in the legal notices. If you want to change your name, you advertise in the legal notices. If you want to foreclose on property, you advertise in the legal notices. And everybody's presumed to read them. Now, we all know that the game is that nobody really reads those things. Uh, now, I must admit, I, there was a time in my life when I used to go over and read the name changes and try to guess which name people were changing. Uh, but that was a little game I played, and it was always funny, and I never did guess the name they wanted to change when it comes up. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's just yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy stuff. But you know, everybody's presumed, re and you got to have that little legal fiction in order for life to work. Because otherwise, if the people don't read the ads, you're back in the same spot you were. If you got to prove that they read them. So anyway, this is to give notice, and a lot of times the notice is not very informative for the city. I guess they just need to look at every piece of our county. They just need to look at every piece of legislation that comes through the general assembly to keep an eye out for it. And local legislation. When going through the uh, committee, uh, local intergovernmental coordination committee, uh, is treated under Rule 18 uh, as a piece of local legislation. All your, the committee looks at is whether or not the people in the delegation, the requisite number, have signed off on it. Uh, General Assembly operates, or I guess to make things move a little quicker, under a what I call local courtesy thing. If all the members of the delegation uh, for the affected jurisdiction agree to something, um, everybody else says, okay, if y'all are happy with it, we are, it because you really don't want someone from Glenn County interfering with business up in Dade County. They just don't have any business there. So, And the bill does have to pass the entire General Assembly. So the General Assembly has come up with the, the local consent calendar, as y'all are familiar with, of uh, which bills are put on if they have the requisite support in the delegation. The interesting thing is that over time, uh, we, we have, let me back up one thing. The number of signatures required depends upon what the delegation has done for that jurisdiction. And there are many variants on what a local delegation is. Um, for instance, you, you could be all the people of, uh, for affecting a particular city, could be affecting a particular county, could be for a judicial district, it could be of any kind of permutation you can have on that. But if they have filed a, for that particular area, have filed a majority of filed with the committee rules that say less than a majority can sign all less than a u unanimous group Boy, I'm having trouble today with that less than unanimity they can have a majority of the people sign it then a majority can sign it and the legislation can proceed otherwise it's going to require every member uh, who affects that area to sign it the area where it's I think the committee has changed over time and it's varied back and forth and is uh, rule 18 uh, of the House of Representatives rules says that uh, this, the legislation affecting the political subdivision, the delegation who represents the, uh, the political subdivision that's being affected has got to sign off on the legislation. The term affected political subdivision has varied over time depending on, on the year and, the, and the, the committee, how they feel about things. In the past, a lot of times, if it was a bit land being annexed into a particular city, then it was viewed as affecting only that city, since the city would be was the one being compelled to provide services for this area, would be brought within their jurisdiction, and it was viewed as this being removed from the county, so the county really didn't have any interest in this. I'm not saying that's true, false, or indifferent. I'm just saying that was the theory behind it. Uh, subsequently, people came to the conclusion that, well, the county is affected because they are losing people there, and since county is, has become, over the last several years, has become more and more involved, especially in the metro area, with providing services, that that also impacts service delivery and impacts a lot of other things. So perhaps the county should be brought into it as well as an affected jurisdiction, which changes the scope of who the delegation is that needs to sign off on it, um, which causes uh, a variety of problems there in identifying as well as getting everybody to agree um, on a particular piece of legislation. And of course there are provisions by which if the delegation can't agree the bill can be brought out and treated as a general bill and and moves forward in the general bill process uh, which also has its ups and downs. And that's a, kind of where we are with it. I'm, I have some comments I think next time on incorporation of cities which I would like to share with the committee but that's kind of where the law is, and Madam Chair, I'm welcome to answer any questions that the committee may have. Do we have questions from the committee? Okay, I'd call on Representative Oliver. Do you know how many de-annexations we've had? I don't know. Uh, anything I would have on that would be totally anecdotal, uh, because uh, unless I see them coming through, I can't remember more than about three or four in the past few years is, is not a very common thing to happen. The, the trend is much more the other way, uh, but it would just be purely anecdotal. We have a conflict in the law over, or tell me if you think we do, 
over whether an annexation of a territory takes schools into a new uh, annexed city. Do you have an, an opinion on that, or is that something you think we need to address? It would be, I, I think the law is not absolutely clear in that regard. I think uh, in the discussions in our office, we have come to the conclusion that when you have an independent school system and you annex uh, property in from the county, that those people in that area do become part of the independent school system. And if you were to annex uh, in a county school house that is located in that area, that it then becomes a part of the independent school system. And that if um, you annex, the, the people that annexed in can go to that school, but the people who were attending that school that were not a part of the annexation area, they must be relegated to other schools in the county, which admittedly would be somewhat disruptive uh, to that school system. Although we've also uh, said, have the opinion that you can do an intergovernmental contract and allow those kids to continue to attend that school if the county and the independent school system so agree. The, the difficulty we always have dealing with school systems that make it a little unclear is that a county school system is separate from the county. It is a different sovereign. There's a, in, in, there are two different things there. The county school system just happens to share the same footprint as the county for the most part. And an independent school system can take on several forms. Some of them are part of the city the way, they're, the way it seems when you read their lack. Some of them are truly independent school systems. They have a, an act separate and apart from the actual city that created them, uh, in which case they would, it's a different sovereign again. So that's kind of where we are on that uh, in our office. I am not saying that's absolute, that's where the courts would go with it, but that's our best thoughts on it as we sit here today. Thank you, Representative Oliver. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call on Representative Rinders. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to talk a little bit about the 100% rule. Yes. And the vagueness of the legal notices. Okay. <clears throat> so if I'm an industrial park, but I'm owned by one group that owns the entire, all the parcels, and someone from the city says, if you'll join the city, I'll provide you this service. and you agree, and then I don't get that service, I then have to get the permission to leave because the promise wasn't fulfilled? Yes, sir. As I understand the way the law works with that regard, once you are a part of the city, you are a part of the city, and you would have to go through the de-annexation process in order to leave the city. And your legal opinion would be that if that promise was made by a member of the commission, city or county, council, that that wouldn't hold legal standing if it's made by an individual without some form of action being taken by that governing authority through their meetings. That would be correct as well. Continuing, Madam Chair, so therefore if a promise is made in exchange for services, your best suggestion would be to get that promise in writing and legal action taken by the affected, whether it be county, or city to protect the interest of the person who's had the promise made to them? That would certainly be wise. Uh, I'm, again, I, when you, I, I don't know that there's a conditional annexation recognized in the law. Consequently, any promises made to you um, are just, just that, they were just promises. And as a result, we can't condition annexation on it. So if you were to have them put it in writing and make it uh, as, as binding as you possibly can, you certainly have a leg up, but I don't know that that would affect the annexation. Once you're annexed, you're annexed, uh, and I don't know that you can say, whoops, time out, we're going back to where we were. Um, I would have to look at that question a lot more before I could be more comfortable with it, but that's, I think it certainly would be a wise course to show that uh, uh, indeed you did have that promise and that there's, they've defaulted on the promise. And if I may continue, Madam Chair, what would your legal opinion be if no action was taken by the governing authority, city or county? Would your client, if, if, if it was your client, would you tell them it would be strong enough if they just put that condition in the legal notice that you felt was lacking anyway, or would you prefer both? Or would you think 
for the interest of that person that felt like a promise was made, which one do you think is more important, the legal ad or actually doing it by a vote of, of the governing authority? A vote of the governing authority always would carry more weight in my, my book because one individual or one person can't bind an entire council no more than you could bind the General Assembly as being a member thereof. Um, I, I think if I were handling that particular situation, I would try to have it so that the annexation vote uh, is done on the same night that the rezoning vote uh, is, or this process is, is started or is, is in motion so that uh, a lot of times you know, there's a lot more stuff involved with the rezoning in order to get there or to providing certain services. Um, but I would try to make them as simultaneously as I could to make sure that everybody remembers the promise and we all stay on the same page. And finally, on the issue that was brought up as it relates to schools, and I don't know where that is in, in Georgia law, but we hear that more, and I don't know if that's, I, I, I don't know where that affects, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on does a county school system whose school may be annexed or incorporated into a city that has a, a city school system, do they have a greater legal standing or higher priority than a private or parochial school sitting in the same area? If I'm a church and I have a pre-K program, could they look at you and make the argument that school system was given greater consideration or that school than my school was? I'm not sure exactly how to respond to, to your question on that one. The, uh, the city school system would take over any school and any students that are brought in by virtue of annexation. The private schools, they're still, they don't have attendance zones. It's just whoever wants to go there goes there. Uh, so they may be brought within the city and be subject to city services, city um, taxation if they are uh, taxable, uh, and those things, but it would not affect any kind of attendance zones or anything that would uh, cause a problem. Their students would still be their students. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Rinders. At this time, I'll call on Representative Taylor. Thank you. Just, just um, to follow up on Chairman Rinders, um, Issue, uh, two things. One, would you, I mean, and this is asking an opinion, not a, um, but if you were to do an annexation, if you were looking at it, would you prefer um, like a unanimous decision of a city council, you know, or a majority versus, like I said, one person making a promise? Well, I, I would, I'd be looking for official action of the council itself. I, unanimity, I, I don't think changes. But something majority, binding. But something binding. Okay. A second question, and this just came to light. Um, 1930 case, College Park, with the schools, um, when they uh, took over buildings from Fulton County to take over their schools, um, it was held, I guess, by the Supreme Court that the tax base at that point had actually paid for those facilities, and they were allowed to annex those without exchange of monetary concern, I guess. Is that That's my understanding. something that we should... Um, possibly look at um, I, and again I'm just quoting the case out of memory here but um. I, th I think the school situation with annexation into cities that have independent school systems is, is something that needs to be fleshed out a little bit and you know and it's, it's not a clear-cut situation like you say uh, some people look at it as we've already our areas already paid for it other people look at it says no the entire school system has paid for it because there's no way to earmark tax dollars and say these tax dollars went to that place and these tax dollars went to that place. It was just tax dollars. Um, some people take the position that with the kids attending there, somebody's still got to educate those children and we're picking them up, so we need the facilities to continue to educate them. Uh, there's pluses, my the infrastructure side, but it would be interesting all to, associated, yeah. Yeah, it would be nice to, to settle that once and for all so we can, I think, be clear in the law what happens so that there's not any... Uh, misunderstandings or misapprehensions if an annexation does proceed and that does occur. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today and hope you'll stay with us until the end of the meeting. Uh, next I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Susan Moore and Marcy, Marcia Rubinson. Um, Ms. Moore has um, served as general counsel for the Georgia Municipal Association 
and she's been in that position for 15 years and I know most of you know Marcy she's around the Capitol a lot and one of the lobbyists so uh, without further ado we will call on you two to make comments thank you madam chair members of the committee I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today cities are the economic engines of the state only 8.17% of the state's total land area is incorporated, yet 67.64% of the jobs are in incorporated areas. Decisions to incorporate, annex, and de-annex are fundamentally local political decisions. GMA supports existing annexation and de-annexation law, which affords property owners the right to petition the municipal governing authority for both annexation and de-annexation. GMA has a comprehensive guide to Georgia's annexation law publicly available on our website, although I'm not sure it could compete with the overview that um, our esteemed legislative council just provided. There are three, three primary methods of annexation, well, four primary methods of annexation in Georgia, and three of those four do require the consent of a majority of the persons living in the area to be annexed. A property owner will be interested in annexing into a city that provides the owner with the greatest value. Cities may and should show property owners in potential areas to be annexed why the annexations would be beneficial to them. There are numerous reasons why property owners and citizens desire to have their property added to the city limits. Many residents are interested in obtaining a higher level of government services than are provided in the unincorporated area. For example, many city residents enjoy better ISO insurance ratings and consequently lower homeowner insurance rates because of enhanced response times that municipal fire departments can offer. Some residents wish to take advantage of being under a smaller jurisdiction of a municipal police department that may have a better officer to resident ratio and a smaller patrolling area. In rural Georgia, Municipalities are often able to provide municipal water service at rates that are more cost efficient for homeowners than paying to pump well water. Many residents wish to take advantage of the efforts that cities have made to create more livable communities. Active downtowns, a strong sense of community and professional planning, along with service coordination and infrastructure improvements like sidewalks and parks, allow city residents to enjoy a higher quality of life. It is no accident that annexation often results in raising the annexed property's value. Lastly, but most importantly, many residents enjoy having access to a smaller and more responsive local government, especially in the metro area of Atlanta, where counties contain hundreds of thousands of residents. Being able to rely on a mayor and council who represent only a few thousand people allows for decision making that respects the needs of individual neighborhoods. Since January 1st, 2007, 87% of the annexations that took place in Georgia, which is obviously the overwhelming majority, were completed through the 100% method. Only 6% of the annexations were completed by local act, which is the legislative process, and 7% by the resolution and referendum method. Some have claimed that annexation places a burden on county governments by depriving them of revenue, making land use decisions difficult or interfering with the provisions of service delivery. These concerns are typically the result of a misconception about annexation or have already been adequately addressed by current law. First, municipal property always remains in the county. It always remains on the county tax rolls. Not only do counties continue to collect revenue on property that is annexed, but they are freed from the costs associated with providing services that will be provided by the city. Second, changing the law to give more power to counties will not eliminate growth pressure. The law already gives counties the power to stop annexations for which they have bona fide land use classification objections. Counties can require that dispute resolution be entered into between the city and county when the county believes that the proposed changes in land use might adversely impact the county. Proposed annexations may not go forward until county objections have been resolved in accordance with the dispute resolution process which was negotiated between the GMA and ACCG leadership. Finally, every city and county must enter into a service delivery strategy agreement in order to work out any problems with duplication and services. 
These agreements can accommodate changes necessitated in service delivery by annexation. Furthermore, almost all cities and counties have intergovernmental agreements and mutual aid agreements in place that establish respective roles for service delivery. Georgia's annexation laws work well, and in the final analysis, the value of annexation is that it empowers people to choose the government that will work with them to provide municipal services and be responsive to their needs. In the 2007 legislative session, the Georgia General Assembly passed House Bill 2, placing into law a procedure for resolving annexation disputes bet between cities and counties when there is a proposed change in zoning or land use. The 2007 law provides for disputes to be resolved by a panel of five arbitrators, which will issue a decision binding on the county, the city, and the property owner. The provisions of the law were crafted by elected and appointed city officials and counting of county officials acting on behalf of GMA and ACCG, and it represents a best effort by both organizations to work together. Since the law became effective, only 24 objections to annexation have been filed by counties with the Department of Community Affairs, and this represents less than 1% of all annexations in that same time frame. In addition to the General Assembly's plenary power to de-annex from within a city, uh, Georgia Code authorizes a city's governing authority to approve de-annexation of land after a written and signed application of landowners and a resolution approving the proposed de-annexation is adopted by the county governing authority. Uh, there were 69 de-annexations between January of 2007 and um, August of 2015. When a new city is created or when property is annexed, the property still remains in the county and still pays property taxes. However, when a property is de-annexed, it, is is it, it is entirely removed from the city. Cities have made investments of infrastructure, including issuing bonds, and any city facing a request for a de-annexation must retain the authority to approve the de-annexation. Um, if a city promises ser services, if I were a property owner and I were hoping to get something in exchange for coming into the city, I think that I would make friends with my legislator because you, you would retain the authority to um, de-annex. That's an alternative method. Um, you could do a legislative de-annexation as opposed to having to go to the city to request um, de-annexation if a property owner was not getting the services that it was promised. So that is a kind of a workaround. Um, the consideration and passage of local legislation by the General, uh, General Assembly is of critical importance to cities. While current processes to pass a local bill does strike a reasonable balance of oversight by the local delegation and the entire General Assembly, ensuring notice of the local legislative proposal to the affected local governments and local taxpayers has not always been assured. The current notice requirement involves a notice to be published in the newspaper in which the sheriff's advertisements are published and that a letter be sent to the governing authority of each affected local government. Current law also requires that an affidavit stating the notice has been published in the newspaper be attached to the bill and become a part of the bill. Unfortunately, the current affidavit requirement contains no reference to the letter notice that's required to be sent to all affected local governments. The Supreme Court has recently held that the letter notice requirement was clearly designed to protect the interest of a local government entity in the notice of a potential amendment to its charter. Therefore, the current law should be amended to ensure that the interest of the local governments is protected and that the, um, the law should be amended to require that the letter notice to local governments be sent by certified mail and that the affidavit requirement um, include a copy of the letter to the affected um, local governments. These additional requirements will ensure communication among local uh, governments, their legislators, and residents. GMA stands ready to be a resource to this committee and will be happy to provide any additional information and thoughts about um, incorporations or any other issues that you identify. Thank you, Marcy. <clears throat> we have a question, uh, Representative Taylor. Just to follow up on that, um, basically, would you recommend, and this is an opinion, um, meets and bounds be put in there? I mean, I've seen notices where you said there's an intended uh, city to be formed in DeKalb County, one-page bill. Um, 
would you like to? I mean, then and again, it's opinion. Like to see meets and bounds, uh, things like that, where people could actually digest. You know what what is going to happen here? I think the key is ensuring that the city and the affected residents know that something is going to happen and have notice and time to respond and react and provide feedback to the legislature. So. Uh, as long as there is a clear path for notice and that a conversation can start, I think that's a, that's a very, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll have Chairman Rinders. Thank you. And I have a series of questions, um, not surprisingly. You were very good with the statistics, and I thank you with that. Um, gives me something to think about. Do you know how many de-annexations have been requested in the last few years? I don't know how many were requested. I only know how many were actually carried out. And that was 69 between January of 07 and August of 15. And, and the, for obvious reasons, if you granted 69 out of 70, I would tell you then there's not a problem. 69 out of 69,000. Right. Then, you know, so that's the only reason why I asked for that cl um, clarification. You started off by saying citizens want to obtain higher level of services. And, and I couldn't agree with you more that many times that's the exact reason why they do it. The confusion becomes what is that definition of service? Um, Y'all were kind enough to give me uh, information. Service is not defined, in, not defined in statute. Provision varies across the state from local government to local government. If you say I'm going to give you garbage pickup, but what that really means is you're going to pick up my appliances and take it to the landfill once a year, that's not a service that's defined when I actually thought you were going to come to my house and pick up my garbage can twice a week. Do you believe, does the Municipal Association believe that it's time to look at those kind of services and see if you can at least apply a minimum standard of what that should be? Because if you leave it to the local, like, and, and, and I want that, then you get Nicholson using a, a, a splice to pave a grandmother's alley or a driveway, you, you know, and that, that ruins it for everybody. Um, what, what do you think about having a minimum standard when we have these services defined that the Municipal Association helps us write up of what, those, what the people can expect? Since the Inactive Municipality Act was passed uh, probably about 15 years ago, 187 cities were dissolved. And I think since then, since and several more have been dissolved um, in the last couple of years, simply because they were not providing the services that their residents and constituents demanded. If a city, a city must, is required to provide three services, and if they're not doing that, then they do dissolve. And if they're not doing a good job of providing the services, I would expect and hope that those constituents say, hey, you promised us garbage service, you're only coming once a year, get a, you know, do something about it or we're going to ask our legislature to dissolve us or we're going to elect a new council. Well, Is there a downside to having a definition of minimum for each one of those 11 things? Well, I guess the only downside is something that you had hit on earlier, just that in one city what might be considered adequate provision of services may not meet what is adequate provision of services in another city, but that's certainly a conversation that we, we would love to have with you. And if those, if I may continue, Madam Chairman, if those services are defined in the charter, and, and I, I really have a hard time wrapping my mind around this, so the lawyer may need to help here, and, and I'd love to welcome you. If it's defined by the charter, which is granted by the state, that, that's correct, isn't it? Th then how do you change some of those services through home rule without the approval of the state. I'll turn this over to Under the Home Rule statute, uh, municipalities have the ability to change a lot of things in the charter. Um, that would be one of them that they can change. They could certainly redefine services. They could... Um, well, that's my point, too. Yeah. The legislature could fix that. My point would be, but if you're doing it through Home Rule, then that really, if you're all of a sudden going to take over a utility authority or something like that, then actually you're doing that through Home Rule which means the legislature doesn't have to do that. You, you use home rule to exempt going through legislative process, do you not? Uh, home yes. Rule, uh, well, I'm trying to make the distinction between what can and cannot be done through home rule. There are a lot of things to the charter that can be changed through home rule, but there are certain things that simply cannot and are left exclusively in the province of the legislature. The form of government, forms of taxation, certain things like that. But because there's a constitutional provision that says that general statute controls over local law, then the general home rule provision does control over the local legislation. So that's actually a constitutional provision that was approved by the people of the state of Georgia is actually let, let the me basis rephrase. for that. If the answer is these services are not provided and it can be done 
through legislation to change it, which was the previous position, then to a certain extent we are limited to what we could change if some of those services were provided by home rule. I'm really not following the question. I'm sorry for being obtuse, but I'm just not following your question. Our X amount of services, uh -huh. her, her, her position was, and the Municipal Association's position was, to a certain extent that these services... The list, yeah. Right. In the inactive municipality statute? Correct. Yes, sir. That they can change from local definition to Absolutely. local definition, and that if we don't, if we have a problem that they're not receiving those, the position was then through legislation, we could go back in and change that. Did you I misunderstand you? No, you could certainly change that statute, right. the inactive municipality well, that, statute. I, mean, that, to, I was assuming that was Marsha's point on uh, checks and balances. Right. And, and, I, and right. I understand that. I'm now trying to drill down to, but if there was a promise made mm -hmm. on an issue that was protected through home rule, then we can't drill down and try to take that corrective action because you would claim home rule. We would, we would probably, it, well, it, again, if you're defining it in general statute, what we're going to have is a conflict of two general statutes. We're going to have a conflict of the general statute that you're enacting and our home rule statute. Um, and in that case, if you've got a more specific one, I think it's going to carry over and supersede over the more general rule, and it is going to carry the day. So I do think it would actually um, change our ability. Now, I hate to be all lawyerly on you, but um, but uh, uh, here goes. I'm looking at Jeff. Um, uh, we also have the supplementary powers provision of the Constitution, um, Article 9, Section 2, Paragraph 3, that lists a number of uh, services that municipalities and counties are authorized to provide. And it goes on um, and notes that uh, the General Assembly may put in place procedures for using those powers, but it cannot take them away from us. So that is also a constitutional provision um, that, again, was approved by the people of the state of Georgia. So it's, it's more complicated than it seems. I'm really not trying to be difficult, but it's, it's, you have to pick your way through it much more carefully. Um, and I think, I think you'd run into much more. And is one reason I think that people have left the definition of these services where it is and left it as a local political issue uh, because it generally sorts itself out. Um, and just to go on the record, the issue of using SPLOS to pave someone's driveway, that's just wrong under any circumstance, any place. Well, we do write those fairly general to give us some wiggle room at the, at the local level. I'd like to hear from Jeff on, on my question, if, and, and, and I'm doing a poor job of, of asking it, but if we're saying that these are services that could be promised, whatever the case may be, are some of those services that could be fixed through legislation protected by home rule? I think part of the problem we're maybe having here is that the services are, I, I don't know that they're defined anywhere, anywhere right. in mm -mm. any charter or anything. For instance, in the average municipal charter, it will say that the city council has the right to provide sanitary and solid waste and garbage collection services, period. It doesn't say they'll do it twice a week. It, in fact, I think it would be probably not a good policy call, although let me hasten to add, I don't do policy. I, but it would seem to me to be a bad policy call to s try to specify because of the changing needs of a city to say three days a week, two days a week. You, you're getting down to the micromanaging of it. Uh, so the General Assembly has the ability to go in and, and micromanage if they choose in certain areas. I don't think other than you, unless you pass a general law that would cover every municipality in the state and said you must have garbage pick up three times a day to be satisfactory, which again is a questionable policy call uh, given the fact that there's so many different needs and so many different municipalities. I don't think you can get down as far as the issue of solid waste, for instance, because that is the supplementary powers that we can't get into except in, by terms of a general law. You can't do it by a local law. Thank you. And, fi and finally, on the questioning of annexation, and you're right, they still pay property and they still pay this. But one of the main criteria is used in loss negotiations. Have y'all come up with a resolution on that yet? Because <laughs> <laughs> I hate picking those winners and losers, too. 
But it is true that one of the main criteria used in loss negotiation is, is population. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that's the elephant in the room. So it would be fair to say that if a city annexed a subdivision of 500 homes, that that does affect or could f affect the loss negotiation, which could be revenue lost by the county. Yeah, it, w it could affect the distribution and the loss negotiation, but uh, if you carry that a step further, the city is also providing more services that the county doesn't have to provide. So the county should have less needs for revenue because they wouldn't have to serve, provide the same services to that group of people. Thank you. Thank you. And now we call on Representative Oliver. Representative Taylor's question about meets and bounds interests me because it relates, it, it relates directly to the most painful part of what we've gone through in my area of when is the map designed? When are people notified of what map? And that simply is, is a great, a great deal of anxiety of citizens when they cannot know how to participate. The idea of having a uh, meets and bounds in the legal notice is the first, would be the first and the most aggressive form of mandating notice to people. And I doubt y'all would suggest that you would support a full legal description of a annexation in a legal ad. But we have to raise this issue at some point as a process issue of when are people going to know what the map is. It's a very serious problem for my constituents. So I want you to, and I'd ask you to tell me when you think the map needs to be fixed, but I want you to be thinking about that. My second question is, what consideration do the bond lawyers have about de-annexation process? I think the bond lawyers would be very concerned about the de-annexation process when it impairs the ability of the underlying infrastructure that was used uh, for the bonds and or if it's GO bonds, if it affects the property tax base um, of the jurisdiction, I would think that would be very concerning. In fact, if someone used bonds and there was a uh, forced de-annexation um, of a large part of a city, I would regard that as something that required, if there were bonds at, at play, that's something that requires a secondary disclosure on the bond market. Um, and that would definitely affect the credit worthiness and the rating of that city and its ability to borrow in the market in the future. And that's definitely a part of our discussion, a very complicated discussion that I'm not prepared to have about schools. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Bonds for improving versus schools versus, uh, that's part of this complicated discussion. Yes, in the past we haven't dealt a lot with the school issue for the very simple reason that there are very few independent school systems and the annexations have typically been 100 percent method um, they've been uh, small mostly in nature um, and so it simply hasn't had the sort of scope that came forward this past session um, I was actually very encouraged quite honestly um, with the robust discussion that people had and I think it's bringing forward a lot of good ideas that we can and should discuss. Thank you, Representative Oliver. Do we have any further questions from the committee? Thank you very much for your presentation. And our last presentation for today will be from Todd Edwards. He's the Associate Legislative Director for the Association, County Commissioners of Georgia. Todd has been with ACCG for 11 years. He specializes in both natural resources and general county government policy. And he will be sharing ACCG's concerns, observations, and suggestions with Georgia's annexation and de-annexation laws. And I see that he also has Clint Mueller, and we're happy to have you here today as well. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, I'm Todd Edwards with the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia. And this gentleman to my right. Clint Mueller, I'm the Legislative Director for ACCG. We appreciate y'all uh, inviting or giving us an opportunity to come and share with you some of the perspectives on Georgia's current annexation and de-annexation law, an issue which we at Georgia counties have dealt with considerably uh, over recent years. Um, first of all, ACCG represents 159 counties in Georgia. We represent all the people, including unincorporated residents and those within municipalities within our borders. Uh, from the previous 
conversation and throughout uh, these issues over the past couple of years, you'll hear a lot about annexation as a property right. Um, that the state of Georgia has crafted a system that allows citizens to enjoy the municipal life as a citizen's right to petition to be annexed and that set counties should have no say so whatsoever in the process, particularly over the 100% method. Those are strong arguments. In many cases, I mean, they, they ring true. It should, there's a certain ring. We live in a country, we, in a state, and local governments that preserve the right to self-determination. We would recognize the natural growth of cities. ACCG is not against annexation. We're not against incorporation. However, re representing all the folks, we have to realize and look at the impacts that annexation has not only on those areas which become incorporated, but also to others whether it be others in the unincorporated area, whether it be the county as a whole, or whether it impacts other cities within the county's jurisdiction. Uh, annexation, similar to the impacts of incorporation, can impact a county's revenue structure. It can impact the effective and efficient service delivery that a county and other cities provide. It can impact and does a community's land use, zoning, and long-term planning efforts. That includes investments in infrastructure. It can impact neighboring unincorporated residents, particularly those who had participated in the planning process, had uh, trusted in a particular land use, and it's changed once a, a district has become incorporated. And it, as I mentioned earlier, it can impa Im impact north or, uh, adjoining cities, uh, their growth boundaries, areas they wish to be annex in their future. Uh, the contentious annexations, for the most part, they're not an issue in rural Georgia. I mean, let's be honest. Metropolitan Atlanta and the rapid growing uh, areas are often where it becomes contentious and where we hear the most concerns expressed by our members. It is uh, as always or often argued that annexation is because property owners often wish to be provided services that are not provided by the county or into un unincorporated residents. Traditionally, that is a ring true for annexation. And in these cases, uh, largely, it's not contentious. I would argue that there's another form of annexation in these rapidly growing areas where contentions do arise, and that is annexation when, in fact, the zoning doesn't grant the land use, or the, the county doesn't grant the land use or zoning changes that a possible developer may want. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but it doesn't correlate to the arguments that are used often or espouse that annexation is purely to receive services not provided by the county. These same areas are within counties that provide these services now. Whether it could be argued whether that's good or bad. These powers granted us in the 70s were a great thing. It's caused service delivery challenges, sure. But a lot of times when it's contentious, the counties do in fact provide a higher level of services. So we have to look at other factors. And a lot of that is dealing with land use. And again, to get areas zoned, uh, what the county may not be willing to do. That is, this explains why so many of the annexations are done through the 100% method. It's a large parcel owned by an individual property owner. And it also explains the trends in annexations over the year, over the years. Um, I have presented to each of you or I had handed out a folder of which we've included a lot of materials. Um, the first one on your left side are the number of annexations. And if you look, the first map is from January 1st, 2001 to January 1st, 2007. I, I'm going to try not to bore you. I'm going to get through this quick, but I did want to give this to you for later use to see you can see patterns here. These, I think everyone would agree, for our high growth years. Uh, there was a lot of development. Things were changing. North Georgia rapidly populating, as other areas of the state. But you can see there are a total of 8,329 annexations. And these, these numbers are as correct as you can get them from the State's Department of Community Affairs. You can see in there where the most annexations were. You can see where there are relatively few. And then if you go on to the next map, from January 1, 2007 to 2015, they've decreased uh, significantly. I'm not saying this is good or bad. I will, I will hint or suggest that it does follow development patterns. I'm not suggesting that all of these were contentious annexations. I'm just saying what we deal with primarily and when they become contentious are not related to service. It's about density. Um, mandated county services. When you're dealing with these type of annexations, you're having counties that are providing a lot of services. Several of these are mandated by state law. Next in your packet are all the services with two asterisks beside them. 
are all the services that counties are mandated to provide. Um, we can't pick and choose these services. We can't select which ones, the cheaper ones we want to provide or the more expensive ones. We can't. We cannot. Those are required by the state law. You got all your courts, probate, superior, magistrate, juvenile, vital records, your constitutional officers, disaster management, tax commissioner, I mentioned the constitutional officers, elections, registration, and uh, very expensive are the jails, quite frankly, sheriffs and public safety. Optional, and again, these aren't essential, but a lot of the, your metropolitan counties are also providing uh, police, fire departments, water, sewer, parks, libraries, animal control, 911 systems, roads, etc. Again, those aren't necessarily required, but as the counties you know, become more populated, these are the ones your counties are providing. The city services, and there was a little bit of conversation on that earlier, again, under state law, they only have to provide three. Now, obviously, some cities provide, like the city of Atlanta, provide a great deal of services. And they do, to, to, they do so uh, to a, a very, uh, how would you say, competently. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of people are provided with these services. So it's a mix and match. It's not always the case that folks want to annex into a city for serv services. And it's not all cities that just provide the minimal services, but there's often conflicts uh, in between when the county is in fact providing the bulk of the services and the city annexes property but is not taking in any increased services in the process. And if you look at some of those dispute resolution cases, and I provided those in the back of your culture, you'll see that a lot of these are from counties that are already providing a high number of those services. That directly correlates or concerns the revenues that are generated when an area either becomes incorporated or annexed into a city. Um, again, we will collect property taxes. I'm not arguing that. The county does continue to collect property taxes. However, if you're taking a piece of land and you're ratcheting up the density to residential and it's incorporated, those property taxes don't pay for the services all the time. There's a certain thresholds that must be crossed, but I mean residential. So think about this. You've got a county, you're providing the services. You pay for it through property taxes, but there are other revenues on which you, you rely. Uh, some dedicated, but a lot to balance the general fund or make up the difference between property taxes and providing those services. When a city annexes land or a new city incorporates, I wanted you to look at a list, and I did provide you of one. It's called Revenues That Switch or Must Be Shared with Municipalities Upon Incorporation or Annexation. The large ones are local option sales tax and special purpose, local, special purpose local option sales tax. They'll have to be renegotiated. The ins and outs I put in there rather than going over all details now. Uh, business occupation tax, that now goes to the city. Insurance premium tax uh, could be the local uh, road maintenance and improvement grants under LMIG. Now, if the city doesn't actually maintain a road system, I believe they still get grants based on their population, even though the county still maintains the roads. Hotel, motel taxes, they go to the city. So we're trying to reach that balance. Contentions come up and often arise again when the services are not equally distributed, yet the revenues to pay for a lot of them get shifted to an incorporated area. And that's what I came today to share some of the issues that we looked at. I think, again, it's uh, harmful uh, if the county continues to provide the bulk of the services. We can't cut services. And if the city is given zoning or land use, that particularly impacts the county that's providing services within those areas. Um, one of the other things I provided you in your packets are a, ma a, a map of individual maps, and these are from the United States Census Bureau, of uh, corporate boundaries within the state of Georgia. And there's various cities. I think there might be 30 or 40 there. They're in alphabetical order. But I share this to you, uh, I show this to you just to imagine when you're providing services and you see an island or you see boundaries uh, that look, quite frankly, um, rather odd, the county going in to serve these areas, and the, and the, the, the pink, by the way, is, is the city or the corporate boundaries of each city. If there's another city coming into each individual map, it is labeled as well in red as the, as the center of the map. But I, I provide that to you so you can see over the years what we've uh, dealt with and providing services. Uh, the counties and what I want to do is, is say and compliment the Georgia General Assembly because over the years y'all have uh, enacted many laws to correct some of what we see here or what, what are the challenges uh, that we've seen here. Um, spoke annexation uh, which you'll see in a lot of these where you got a little pink strip running down the, the road then expanding in other places uh, that was prohibited in 2000. 
It can now only be used to annex municipal owned property if the county agrees to it. Uh, contiguity, after 2000, uh, y'all put in limits that either one eighth of the area boundary or 50 feet of the area to be annexed must directly abut the city. We commend you for that. Um, also, there's requirements in there that or, uh, there's allow that both, both city and county agree the 100% method can overcome uh, some of these limits. Uh, in 1992, the General Assembly uh, passed a law that no longer allows the formation of unincorporated islands, but there's still hundreds and hundreds of those islands across Georgia. And when you look at a map, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to name any cities in particular, but just think of providing fire and police service by the county inside those areas that are surrounded. I mean, it, it gets to be difficult. It's not effective. It's not efficient government. It's not, not the highest, best use of taxpayer dollars. Y'all have corrected this, but many remain. Um, there are still areas that can almost become, I mean, there's contiguity requirements, but it can isolate services in a particular area. Um, and that those are some of the challenges that quite frankly arise in the division and responsibility providing services among Georgia counties. Um, and I would say a lot of these directly correlate with the high growth patterns of northern Georgia. Uh, Clint, did you have anything to add before I go on dispute resolution? Dispute. Go ahead. I'll just say I know the conversation came up earlier about what <coughs> is the service. And I think that that's an important distinction because you can say anything's a service, but what do you have to provide at a minimum level before it's truly a service? So, for instance, in the loss negotiations, if you provide three services, you have access now to all these sales tax revenues. Well, there is no minimum. So if you say you provide the service, you provide the service, basically. Um, and it could be done through a contract or it could be done uh, in, in a variety of ways. Um, so I think one thing that, that we look at is not only the type of service, but is there a defined minimum level that you could truly say, well, that is an actual service being provided. I'd like to also point out, and I, it's, it's easy sometimes to think that it's just, oh, there go the counties again fighting with the cities. That's, it's not always the case. It's not all annexations, even only a fraction that are, are confrontational. But it's some cases and in some areas of law that over time we've responded to and y'all have to accordingly and, and we commend you for that. And it's not just a city county thing. Often uh, in terms of these new incorporations, a lot of these uh, conflicts, so to speak, were between cities. Cities, uh, cities annexing, cities looking to uh, incorporate or annex uh, commercial or profitable properties while others wanted the same thing for their growth plan or to make their, their cities feasible, which as I understand will be the next uh, study on incorporating. But th it, again, we are not against annexation. We are not against cities, but representing all the folks, these are what we hear from our constituents. Dispute resolution process, and I think Marcy and Susan did a pretty good uh, job on uh, going over it. In 1998, there was one implemented in service delivery, or excuse me, under House Bill 489. Uh, we believe it was largely ineffective in 2007, 2008. We had House Bill 2. A lot of y'all were here for that. Uh, I went through the, the, the committees um, for a large part. It's made a bit of difference. I think uh, there was a compromise, as noted by our friends in the Municipal Association, between their and our associations. Uh, established a procedure. Um, it was noted earlier that counties could stop annexation. I'm not sure if I heard that correctly, but counties, the, the, the panel or the, the arbitration process that was put in law, they can't approve or deny an annexation. It simply doesn't have that authority, but they can attach zoning, land use, or density conditions for a period of one year following. Uh, following the dispute resolution process. They'd be put on the, the parcel of the plot, plat, um, the deed, uh, that they could put conditions uh, coming out of that process for a period of one year. After that one year, uh, that would no longer be the case. So it's not our ability to stop. It's our ability to object. If we object, uh, there are pretty strict grounds and limited grounds on which we can object over as a county. Uh, have to do primarily with the pros proposed change in zoning or land use and a proposed uh, increase in density. 
and I can provide any more information. I mean, it, it, it goes in and out, but that was a process agreed to. I think what we're hearing from our concerns, and it was noted uh, in the earlier conversation on uh, whether, uh, what, what is the appropriate notice, what is the time to react? I think the concern, we have 30 days uh, to react to any proposed annexation once the city gives us notice of it. Uh, we have to, in order to object, we have to order, or go through a majority vote of the county commission the objection must be well documented we must provide evidence of any financial impact again based on those valid objections listed earlier and then it must be delivered a certified mail um, we'd like to have more than 30 days obviously uh, it was increased from 7 to 30 at this point I, it would make a lot easier for us to get staff and commissioners both involved in the process if we had them I'd like to you know for, for later consideration um, immunity from lawsuits uh, we've had some opinions from the attorney general we're not quite certain that those who participate both in the city or the county when making these decisions if you upset somebody who didn't get granted the zoning etc the question is whether or not we the panelists who serve on those arbitration panels are immune if we're looking at that law um, in your packets uh, Department of Community Affairs on the back of the right side you can see the results and I believe the Municipal Association mentioned from the uh, dispute resolution cases and this is um, in the past several years since 2007 again a period of low growth in Georgia a lot of this would have occurred prior to that date a lot of accusations knowing this process were coming we have examples were put in to, 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 to be previous uh, to that date and finally with this process Nothing's foolproof. It was the best we could do in good faith compromise with both the General Assembly and uh, the George Municipal Association. Um, we do have whether or not it's binding, I don't know. I do know, however, that just last week we had a case of a city in Cherokee County that absolutely refused to participate in it. They were given notice later in the week by the Department of Community Affairs that their qualified local government status would be revoked. That letter is also in your packets. Um, I don't know if the city, if that means much. I mean, when you lose your qualified local government status, it basically means you can't get a permit, a license from the state. Uh, if you're an EPD permit for water, or if you ran radar, I guess you would have to weigh in, your, in, in their minds whether or not that was a worthy punishment or not. But we do have those cases. Uh, or that, that case I did want to bring to your attention about resulting from the dispute resolution process. The last subject I did want to go over was the subject of de-annexation. And we've heard through the incorporation debates that folks should have a right to choose what city they belong to. Uh, and, and we've gone over that. However, there, there is often the case and these same counties are providing services where a city promises a certain area parcels, properties, services by a certain point after their annex. Um, it could be that they haven't delivered those services or that the property owner feels that these services were provided in a substandard manner, or quite frankly that a, the wish for self-determination that an individual has felt a city has grown too large and unresponsive to their individual needs. Um, current law does not allow that property owner to de-annex without having to go through the unilateral authority of the, the, the city governing authority. Um, are there solutions to this? It's been talked about, and I mentioned it was brought up with the bond earlier. I think the same could be said for a lot of the infrastructure and bond, bonds that the county takes out to provide services in an area that is later incorporated or annexed but they're no longer receiving money back from those services. It is complex. Um, I think there's a lot of good arguments to be made on what impacts this may have to the city, with, uh, the city or boundaries on the outside edge, creating unincorporated islands. My simple suggestion would be this, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever safeguards and protections that you can protect the bonds, unincorporated islands, contiguity, whatever have them be the same for both annexation and de-annexation there are challenges but we experience those same challenges uh, throughout the incorporation annexation process but I think in Georgia uh, once you're in a city you're in a city unless that city says otherwise and uh, it should be a property right and it should be enjoyed if we're having a if it's an absolute argument that uh, the right to self-determination individuals should be able to choose cities I think it works both ways and I'll I'll, I'll preempt what may be a question or I'll, I'll respond to it in advance and it's a fair question 
was asked during Senate testimony on a bill a couple of years ago was whether or not counties would then agree that de-annexation from a county should be a private property right as well, and that's a good one. It got, it got me to thinking a little bit. I think if current law allowed parcels to be annexed from one county into another county, I think if ACCG were up here arguing that this should be a fundamental property right to allow this, then that would be a fair question. I might agree with you. However, current law doesn't currently or doesn't allow for that. Uh, Y'all can do it just as you can in de-annexation through a procedure whereby the General Assembly can de-annex land from one part of the county to another, but I, I don't see it in quite the same lens. Uh, again, at the end of the day, whatever law, laws or rules apply to annexation should also apply to de-annexation. That gets on to the notice requirements that y'all were talking about earlier. Um, whatever notification on annexation, uh, y'all may change, and I know y'all, a few of y'all had asked me about that. We just ask the same. It's that simple. If there's a concern about the city of Waycross, whether or not it was given appropriate notice, uh, whether they were caught by surprise on the de-annexation, et cetera, et cetera, whatever rules you put in place, have them be the same. There shouldn't be a double standard there. I mean, that's our simple answer. Whatever argument we go through, and we'd be happy to go through these conversations with you all, um, I think the rules should apply equally to both. Um, in summary, I've um, provided a, a ACCG's policy positions on annexation, de-annexation, and corporation. Um, I've also pro provided a list of the, the means and the rules which apply to legislative annexation. And those are the rules that generated the most questions on notification, et cetera, just so y'all are aware of them. Um, Jeff did a good job of explaining it earlier. Uh, we commend the General Assembly for working with us to address a lot of these challenges over the years with annexation. Will we ever address them all? We will not. Will you ever hear from our other associations that there are more to deal with? Probably. But we'll continue to sit and work in good faith with our good government partners, both at the city and the state levels, to try to craft sensible solutions that help not only those getting incorporated or annexed, but also the other stakeholders who are greatly involved in this process. With that, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Todd and Clint. Do we have any questions from the committee? of these two presenters at this time. Seeing none, we appreciate you being here today and we look forward to having you at our future meetings. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the uh, public comment part of our meeting. And if you would, please go to the podium and use the microphone. And I would call on Buzz Ahrens uh, to be our first uh, public comment. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me a moment to speak. Uh, I'm Buzz Ahrens. I'm in my ninth year as chairman of Cherokee County. And um, I, I'm delighted with uh, ACCG's initiatives. I, I certainly, and we understand the city's desire to grow. We'd like to believe there's a higher degree of future predictability. And, and I'd like to give you four thoughts. One is to align the comprehensive plan process. They're out of sync. The cities do them in a different time frame as the county, and you don't have an opportunity really to align your goals and objectives in a proper way. Um, and it avoids uh, an unnatural growth result. Second, Cherokee County has used what are called growth boundaries, where you sit down with the municipalities and we kind of lay out a future look and we kind of agree that action going forward to grow is okay within those boundaries. City of Canton never expires. The city of Woodstock expired, but we're okay with that. We uh, did not have the opportunity to develop one in the city of, of Holly Springs because basically, their look-see was double what our expectation level was being. You'll see an example of that in a moment. Um, we'd like to see third point is to strengthen the criteria. Some of the conversation has already addressed that. Criteria for annexation, for resolution opposition, and for leveling the playing field uh, for de-annexation. Minimum standards could really help a lot an objective measurement process, a matrix that attempts to define and value from a fiscal standpoint the impact of, of, of a city uh, annexing and rezoning to four or five times the density 
of what the, the county property would have been and might have been developed. Um, and lastly, as an example, and, and with your permission, I'm going to leave this map. Um, it shows the results of, in 2003, 600 acres were, were annexed. We were going to have about 1,500 residences. In August of 07, before the September 1st change in the process, uh, I was delivered 21 annexation notices with 450 acres. Due to the downturn in the economy, those are now beginning to happen as far as rezonings and build out. And the, um, we've had four or five already this year. What I will do is I'll, I'll show you this map and I will submit comments subsequent. I wanted to participate and listen to, to the process. But if you look at this, Mr. Aarons, yes. your two minutes are expiring. Okay. If you'd like to leave the map, I will the leave committee, it. Uh, and if you just look from the, from the left to the right, you can see what I'm speaking about. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking the time to be here today. Uh, next, we have Carl Fight. All the secrets. I'll be brief. I'm a, I'm a, a commercial property owner, and uh, I'm in an annexation fight with Avondale and. Uh, Cater. I represent 60 acres in between us. The first time there's five ways of annexation. The illegal method. That's how I found out the first time. Bill 1130, House Bill. I've been going around and around with these guys for years. When we found out we were going to be annexed this year, or last session, we petitioned them, Avondale, to let us out and petitioned Decatur to take us. Because we don't vote, we're nothing. But to the county, I'm worth about a million dollars in property tax, okay? If I go into a city, I'm looking at 16% tax increase. I think I should pick what city I go to. And it, you only gotta change three words, it took that guy an hour and 43 minutes to mention commercial property. I'm a commercial, a commercial property owner. In the four ways, all you gotta do is add not property owners, but commercial property owners. That's it, three words. We've been here for three hours, two hours. That's it, commercial property owners. Then the cities have to listen to us. That means if I petition, which I did, to come out, 75% of us agreed in a petition for us, for me and Mike Easterwood to go to Avondale and say, take us out of your map and Decatur, take us in. We don't mean nothing. They looked at us like deer in the headlights. They never, ever acknowledged that we petitioned them. They didn't read it in public. They didn't keep it anything. In fact, Avondale, when Decatur's.com asked them about it, 10 minutes later, they lost it on their desk. Mr. Fight, your Thank two you. minutes are expiring. Thank you for being here with us. Okay, I would now call on Ms. Hopkins. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I'm Diane Hopkins, City of Waycross, Waycross, Georgia, and I thank y'all for having this committee today. It's very, very, very informational for us. Um, recently, you know, House Bill 523 was introduced and de-annexed us out of Pierce County. And I appreciate everyone's comments today because we learned a lot because we never were given a letter of any notice of any kind. And the bill was presented one day signed by the governor the next, and it has caused a huge financial burden to our city. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure over there. They asked to be in 1989 annexed to the city, and all these businesses that built over there, the property was in the city when they built there. So they knew they would have to pay city taxes. Well, now they want to annexed out, but they want our water and sewer. Pierce County has nothing to offer them and they want everything we have with no taxes. So we are really hearing about it from our constituents about how they're having to pay for these services over there. So when y'all study this committee, 
please take all this into consideration. And if you don't mind, our engineer would like to explain a little bit about the infrastructure. Thank you. Um, we, that annex part of Waycross or that city of Waycross that goes into Pierce County. Right. It's my understanding and just, and I, and I said, so help me. I, I, I need you to clarify for me because I don't know which side is which. Okay. How many people live in the city of Waycross in Pierce County? Okay. It's commercial and residential. Most of that area is commercial. Just recently, Are there voters in Pierce County in the city of Waycross? Uh, voters in, Wa in Pierce County, city of Waycross. There were. Yes, sir, there were. There's four residents. There's a subdivision that has about um, 50 lots out there. Uh, only three houses have been built during the downcome. But we went in and put infrastructure, purple pipe, everything in that community and in, in that subdivision that the developer developed. Now it has been de-annexed out. We have three residents that can't get the services provided in the city because we can't send police and fire over there for liability issues. They did not want to be de-annexed out. They were never notified of that. We have a letter from a bank who now owns all those lots. There are 41 lots over there that are buildable lots. They were fixing to sell these lots. And when this de-annexation came up, they lost their sales. The attorney contacted our attorney and said, what's going to happen now? So the bank president, who is an attorney as well, he came to us asking us and sent us a letter to please see if we can get them annexed back in. These are half acre lots that cannot be provided water and sewer like a septic tank or water on those lots. So they aren't going to be able to sell those lots because they cannot provide them water and sewer. So it's putting the bank in a big dilemma because they were held holding the bag on that whole property. So we need some help and we really, all we want to do is see if we can annex that subdivision back in so that bank can proceed to sell these foreclosures on these lots and help these residents build houses in there to get water and sewer. Thank, and thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and the, this was just put on my radar screen, so just give me a little wiggle room because the, and, and I, I'm saying I had people telling me there's people there and there's people not there and this and that. But but one of the points that was just brought to my attention was if I'm being taxed by the, by the city of Waycross, and it can be any city, I, I, I love Waycross, the largest you. city in the largest county in the largest state east of the Mississippi. Thank you. But there is an argument there that there is taxation without representation, that if nobody lives there and can't hold anybody accountable, which is part of the municipal associations, everybody else holds your elected officials accountable accountable, which I, I, I agree with, if nobody lives there and can't vote, then that then they don't if if, if they're due courses through Pierce County, how, how do you how, how, that's that would be part of their argument and we see that in other areas, but right. this is so unique. Well let me give back let me go back and refresh this, okay? There's a church also that has fifteen hundred members. Over half of those members of the church do live in the city of Waycross, so there are voters in that area other than those four residential houses or three. That would be a tax-exempt church? Yes, but the constituents that go to that church are my constituents, and yes, they do pay property taxes, and they don't want to have to pay property taxes on infrastructure that we're not getting anything out of. Three of the business owners that live on that road also live in the city of Waycross, so they are voters as well. My Thank voters. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Rinders. Um, okay, our next speaker is uh, Jessica Deal. Hey, um, Jessica Deal, I'm the city engineer for the city of Waycross. First, I'd like to thank y'all for having this work session and um, allowing us to have some input. Everything I was going to talk about today or touch on has been discussed in some shape or form, so I do, do appreciate that. The main key here was communication. We would like to see some communication improved. Um, the publication process, which again was, was discussed, and I believe y'all are working on that to improve it. I, we realize that the legislation can't send a public notice out to every property owner in, in an area, but they can send notice out to every municipality. And it, and it could be their responsibility to make sure that all of these property owners 
and everyone that is involved knows exactly what is happening and, and how it will affect them because like the city of Waycross did not know, a lot of those property owners did not know. They, they were unaware that not only, um, th this is just, it's not, a, it's not only a tax problem, it's, it's got infrastructure and ISO ratings. Those property owners were unaware that their insurance rate would increase because of such a dramatic difference between the ISO ratings between Pierce County and the city of Waycross. We have a rib site located over there, um, a lift station, a lot of infrastructure that we did not have at the time that it was installed, it was in the city of Waycross. Therefore, we had access to maintain that. Now, we have no legal documentation saying that we, we may maintain that infrastructure. And it's just, if a de-annexation was to occur, it, it would have been better to ensure that there was a joint agreement between the two parties beforehand. Our lift station is setting directly beside a, a state ditch that is going directly to the Satilla River. So if something happened and we didn't have access to maintain that lift station, it, whether we cut off water and sewer or not, if, if someone connected wells and, and the system filled up the lift station and overflowed, it would overflow directly into the Satilla River. It's just we wanted to make sure that, that communication was improved with the process because there's a lot more involved than just property taxes. Ms. Dill, we appreciate your comments and your two minutes are up. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Danny Lamont. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Lamont. I'm the finance director with the city of Waycross. Uh, I just want to add uh, to uh, what has been said from the city uh, from the budget standpoint. Um, as you, you all know, the budget is a real important part of uh, operating the city government. And uh, this de-annexation kind of put us in a situation where we may lose possibly $77,000 plus dollars in uh, tax revenue, uh, which we, we didn't plan for. Um, if we had proper notice, we could probably uh, maybe done some plans to, to counteract that, but we never got notice of anything of any sort. Um, and I wish we would have got that and like to have that considered um, when you guys are talking about it going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, we have Bernard Knight. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm here today on behalf of my client, who is a major landowner and developer uh, in the, uh, of industrial properties in the Stonecrest and Lithonia area. Uh, and I'll try to be very brief about this, and I think my comments to some extent are going to echo those of the gentleman who wore the magnificent hat. Uh, in the annexation method of city councils passing a resolution and thereafter a referendum, there is a major gap. And that is that major potential major stakeholders, commercial and industrial property owners, obviously they have a major stake in the game but they have no voice. They're cons pre presently, at my understanding is their consent need not be obtained. It's very different, of course, with the 60% method. We would like somehow the procedure to be amended so that some sort of consent or at least particip uh, participatory role in the process is given to the business owners within an area to be annexed as well as the folks who live there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, next, I would call on Joel Thibodeau. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chair, Jason Larry and I represent the Stonecrest City Alliance. Uh, we find that our comments will be more appropriate for the next meeting on incorporation, so we give up our time. Thank you, sir. Okay, and our last person that signed up is Commissioner Marvin Arlington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Marvin Arrington, Jr. Uh, from Fulton County. Um, thank you all for hosting this today. Uh, it was very informative. We are in a particular, particularly troublesome situation in that we in Fulton County are currently being sued by the 14 cities in the county 
because we continue to provide services to the unincorporated areas, uh, such as the paving of streets and sidewalks, which is what we did for years in all around the county in North Fulton County. Now that these areas have incorporated, they have a problem with us continuing to provide paving of streets and sidewalks in the unincorporated area, and they have sued the county for doing so. Um, so the unincorporated, the people that live in the unincorporated area have to share in the expenses, but they do not get to share in any of the revenue that is generated by the city. Additionally, we have a specific petition for annexation in the city of Atlanta that proposes to include two local schools, uh, A. Philip Randolph and Sandtown Elementary Schools. There'll be over 3,700 students displaced from these schools. The current annexation law was written at a time when the city of Atlanta and Atlanta Public Schools were one entity. They are no longer one entity. This law needs to be changed to reflect that they are no longer one entity. Under the current law, the, the schools would go to the city of Atlanta, okay, without any regard to APS. So APS would not be able to operate these schools. Fulton County would not be able to operate these schools. So I am here on behalf of the 3,700 residents in my neighborhood that want their students to continue to attend Fulton County schools. And, and to ask you all to allow for the county to have more than a, a land use objection. We should be able to object for reasons just like this, for reasons that the fact that well, 3,700 kids will be displaced. And where will they be displaced to? They'll just be displaced to another school where another 3,700 kids will be impacted. Uh, thank you for your time today. Please, please, please uh, allow the county more than just a land use objection. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Uh, would be happy to receive any further comments from any of you that are here today through written statements, as we said earlier. We, of course, invite you to come back to the next meeting. Um, do we have any closing comments or questions from the committee? Okay, well, I mean, we've all heard today that the issues that do relate to annexation and de-annexation are certainly significant issues. and. They, they are impacting our schools, our businesses, individuals, local governments, and, and the entire state. Um, the procedures for appropriately introducing and enacting local legislation involving all the methods that we heard about today are vitally important as they do impact such a large number of citizens in so many wide-ranging ways. Uh, the potential, of course, for uh, problems and conflicts are more likely to happen when we the process is not well understood. As legislators, we sincerely do want the process to be clearly defined. We want it to be open. We want it to be fair. And uh, uh, most of all, we want it to be in the best interest of all the citizens of Georgia. So appreciate your time uh, here today. I hope you'll join us again. Our next meeting is September the 24th, and we will be looking at the incorporation of cities. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.